Hi, welcome, and thank you for uh, joining all of us here live from the Debicki studio here in Houston Methodist Hospital. Uh, my name is Eric Yang. I am one of the uh, cardiovascular imaging faculty, and I have the pleasure of continuing the series of multimodality talks uh, that, um, that have been going on every Tuesday um, uh, for the past year. Uh, today I have the uh, uh, pleasure of talking with you guys about uh, stress MRI um, and methodology, current role, and case studies. Uh, for those of you joining us online, um, I encourage you, if you have any questions, to, uh, go to either go to pollev.com and enter Debakey and, and respond, uh, respond to the activity with your questions. Alternatively, you can join by text by texting Debakey to 37607 and um, uh, text in your, your questions or comments. Um, and without further ado, I'm going to uh, uh, go forward with my talk. And uh, we're switching gears here a little. Uh, so the first half, of, uh, first half of this academic year, we've been spending a lot of time talking about, uh, about the basics of the different imaging modalities and, uh, and basic, basic structural assessments and the groundwork for some, some of the uh, uh, further um, uh, more functional testing. Uh, with this talk, I'm um, sh shifting gears and, and talking more about, uh, talking more about uh, functional assessment, uh, in this case of the heart, uh, in, in, in setting ischemic heart disease. So uh, I like to try to keep this interactive. So for those of you, you who have joined us on Zoom, um, especially the fellows and, and, uh, and, and other uh, um, uh, staff members, um, uh, any, any uh, uh, chime in for any questions. So why do we do stress testing? Uh, can any, any of the fellows think of any uh, reasons off the top or, uh, off of your heads uh, why we do uh, stress testing in general? Any takers? I guess uh, people are still uh, uh, joining in with their lunches and all. Uh, but the reasons for stress testing are, uh, are many. Um, with stress testing, we usually seek to look for functional capacity in patients, try to determine their cardiovascular prognostic risk. Uh, more, most often, we use it to detect is ischemia and uh, especially with, uh, with regards to significant coronary artery disease. And also, uh, sometimes we come across uh, uh, so-called moderate uh, coronary stenosis where the uh, hemodynamic significance is in question. And so uh, functional testing is often used to, to help uh, discern, discern this. Um, when it comes to CAD detection, um, this has be become uh, an entire uh, field in itself. Um, back when uh, Diamond and Forster first put out their initial uh, uh, risk assessment using history and histories and physicals. Um, they came up with the uh, well-known diamond, diamond and Forster uh, pretest probability, where you would look at the age, um, look at the age, gender, and uh, uh, presentation of symptoms, uh, asking three very simple questions: whether or not uh, uh, the uh, the chest pain symptoms were brought on uh, by stress or or uh, by emotional stressors or or physical stressors. Uh, whether or not it occurred in the chest, and whether or not it was re uh, relieved with rest or with nitroglycerin, and just using using uh, those uh, simple simple uh, questions and, and definitions, they were able to de um, to stratify patients into three different types of of angina, ranging from typical angina, atypical angina, and non-angina chest pain. Based on this, combined with the age uh, age by des uh, decile and uh, gender, you could then. Uh, um, uh, put down a pretest probability of low, intermediate, or high for uh, presence of significant coronary artery disease. And uh, in patients uh, where we're trying to detect CAD, obviously those with very low risk, uh, we we tend to uh, tend not to pursue further testing if the if the um, likelihood of finding any significant coronary artery disease is low. Whereas those who have very high pretest probability of coronary artery disease. Uh, further testing is usually not indicated. You would send these patients straight for the uh, um, uh, cath lab to undergo definitive coronary angiography. It's this big wide area that ranges between a 10 to 90 percent pretest probability, what we call intermediate, that uh, usually benefits from f uh, functional, functional testing. And uh, when it comes to functional testing, we take advantage of something known, uh, um, a concept known as ischemic cascade. And, it, and this uh, harkens back to uh, what happens uh, to, to to the heart and uh, at various stages, leading from from um, mild perfusion defects early on um, uh, with a functionally significant stenosis, all the way to frank ch chest pain and everything in between. As you can see, um, perfusion defects uh, are one of the earliest things to show up, along with metabolic alterations and diastolic dysfunction. 
regional wall motions, uh, deep, uh, drop in systolic function, ECG changes in, in chest pain, those are more, more advanced stages of ischemic heart disease, and, and usually we would like to pick this up sooner. Uh, CMR does have a, a role at different stages, as you can see. Um, uh, CMR uh, with delayed enhancements will pick up uh, infarct if it, um, as a consequence of a prior M uh, MI. SNAs will pick up uh, wall motion abnormalities, and of course a perfusion will allow us to see any uh, perfusion abnormalities that uh, indicate um, a, a functionally significant, uh, um, uh, f functionally significant uh, 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 coronary lesion. So how do we uh, go ahead and stress patients um, in, in the different settings, uh, be it uh, be it in a, um, a in a nuclear lab, in the MRI lab, um, or even in the echo lab. Uh, we, uh, they can be roughly divided into two different categories. These include exercise and pharmacologic. With exercise, uh, I think almost everyone is familiar with the Bruce, uh, uh, Bruce treadmill protocol. And uh, this is the protocol where patients would run on an incline uh, at a set speed that then uh, increases in incline and speed every few minutes. Um, and, and during this time, uh, EC, uh, the patient's being monitored for symptoms for any kind of ECG arrhythmias as well. Uh, there's also the uh, possibility of recumbent bikes or uh, ergometers, and uh, this is helpful for patients when you want to do uh, additional scanning, such as uh, echo, and you don't want the patients moving uh, around too much. Treadmill echoes are possible, but uh, are less than ideal considering how fast you have to have to uh, uh, move a patient from, from the treadmill to, to the bed um, to get the information. Uh, on the pharmacologic side, uh, various agents have evolved over time. Uh, dobutamine is one of our oldest, and uh, this is a, a positive inotrope that uh, cause, causes the heart to, to, to beat faster and, and, and beat uh, more forcefully, and, hence uh, its uh, classification as an inotrope. And then, of course, there's diperidamol, adenosine, and regadenosine, and these are different uh, vasodilator agents. So, more commonly used in the in the pharmacologic side um, for perfusion imaging, uh, is is the um, uh, vasodilator stress, and we'll go into that and um, those agents in the protocol in a little bit more detail uh, further further in the talk. So. I talk about all the different agents and, and ways we can go ahead and stress. What exactly are we trying to, uh, to cause uh, hemodynamically in a patient? Well, what we're trying to do is trying to provoke uh, uh, what, um, and increase the coronary blood flow in patients. And when we do that, uh, when we do that, uh, usually in a patient with, a, uh, with no significant stosis, you get very little pressure drop. Uh, you get, uh, you get uh, um, uh, very little resistance uh, w with increasing flow, and you also uh, get compensatory increased myocardial blood flow uh, as well. But when a stenosis is present, that begins to limit, uh, lim uh, create different changes like a drop in pressure. As you can see here, a 70% lesion causes, causes a, um, a somewhat uh, de uh, decrease in, in flow uh, and, and pressure um, in, in this diagram, and sh uh, whereas a 90% lesion causes a very profound dr uh, a drop in pressure due, due to um, Due to a loss in, uh, associated with the loss in flow as well. Um, same, same with the myocardial blood flow. As myocardial blood flow is compromised, the amount of uh, uh, coronary blood flow that, that then the heart can mount um, is also subsequently decreased as well, as uh, shown in, in this graph here. Okay, and then uh, shown here is what happens as the percent stenosis increases and what happens to to the flow. And the magic number um, everyone throws around in the, in the cath lab is about 70% because that's when uh, a great amount of uh, blood flow um, it, it, uh, begins dropping. There is a gray area, as I mentioned before, between uh, roughly 50 and 70 percent, what we call the moderate coronary stenosis, and that's where uh, 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 hemodynamic significance testing and, fraction, and in the cath lab, fractional flow reserve is used to, to assess things. So in the, in the uh, stress lab, what we're trying to do is, is increase blood flow and trying to look for such mismatches. This is illustrated in this di uh, diagram here, uh, showing on the left, uh, uh, on the top, uh, um, a system, uh, system at rest versus a, uh, the bottom, a system at, at, um, uh, under vasodilator stress. And as you can see, at rest, the uh, coronary blood flow is roughly the same across the board, no matter whether or not that stenosis is present. But the moment you start introducing um, uh, increased blood flow of some sort, um, a 70% stenosis will, uh, whereas a normal response will lead to augmentation in coronary flow uh, by six, uh, six times our coronary flow reserve of six, uh, a 70% lesion will result in a coronary flow reserve of, uh, uh, of up to only three in the, in the uh, diseased, diseased uh, uh, territory. 
uh, whereas a 90% lesion will drop it even further to one compared with a normal six in a normal territory. So um, this, this uh, leads to um, perfusion uh, mismatch, and this is what uh, we, uh, what we uh, look for when we, uh, when we attempt, attempt to do stress, um, stress perfusion studies. In regards to sensitivity and specificity of various uh, testing modalities, there are actually quite a lot. Um, uh, shown here are the sensitivity and specificities for the different, uh, different um, um, exercise uh, uh, methods and, and modalities. Um, as you can see, our uh, uh, oldie but goodie, the uh, treadmill test, the exercise ECG test, actually has pretty poor um, um, uh, sensitivity and specificity. This is from the European guidelines from 2013 um, uh, looking at stable CAD. Um, but it's been quoted anywhere between 60 and 70 percent, um, um, roughly, um, depending on which, which guideline that you look at. Compare that with uh, other modalities such as stress echo, SPECT, um, uh, and, and uh, Dubini stress echo, and you start seeing upwards of 80 percent uh, 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 sensitivity and specificity as well. Once you start crossing over into, uh, into um, um, uh, the vasodilator stress uh, modalities uh, with like uh, vasodil vasodilator stress, uh, echo, SPECT, MRI, um, you, you start seeing sensitivity and specificities approaching that of, of roughly about 90 percent um, uh, for sensitivity, 80 percent for specificity. Um, and cardiac CT um, has great sensitivity when you were able to uh, find no lesion whatsoever and, and confidently say that at least there's no, no uh, major, major uh, stenosis in the major epicardial vessel. And of, and of course, uh, we are lucky to have Dr. Amala join us in our practice recently, and we now have the ability to do vasodilator uh, stress, uh, stress PET, um, and, uh, um, but that has been a, uh, around for a while and um, is continuing to evolve. I mentioned uh, um, issues with moderate st uh, coronary stenosis, and that's always been a, d uh, a, a difficult, uh, uh, a, difficult uh, um, uh, a lesion to deal with, uh, because if it is functionally significant, you would want to stent it to improve, improve patient outcomes. Um, uh, but if it's not functionally significant, then it doesn't make sense to do anything uh, of, of the sort. And shown here are, um, uh, are a comparison to uh, sensitivity and specificity of uh, the different modalities, and forgive the small print, um, but uh, SPECT is, is in yellow, that's a yellow curved. Um, MRI is shown in red, and um, uh, in dark red, and you can see it actually has a very good uh, 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 AUC, it's uh, practically almost, uh, almost to the left and up. Uh, but it, and it's comparable to PET scan and CT scan uh, in, in comparison with uh, um, invasive coronary angiography with the FFR to detect uh, functionally significant lesions. So that is the premise behind the hemodynamics and, and, the, and the correlation with, uh, with uh, uh, the cath lab in general. So shifting gears, so uh, um, obviously this is a kind of redundant question because I've already shown you data about uh, stress uh, about stress CMR. Um, that, so yes, the bottom, bottom line is yes, uh, stress CMR uh, can be performed, uh, but uh, uh, there are many uh, different parts to it. For one, you actually need scanners, and shown here are, uh, are um, the three different uh, semen scanners um, that are used for cardiac purposes. We actually have three dedicated for cardiac purposes at our institution. And uh, you also need gadolinium contrast. Gadolinium contrast is an extravasating extracellular uh, contrast agent that allows us to highlight myocardial tissue, highlight infarct, and allows us to uh, enhance the blood flow as well. You also need um, um, a telemetry system uh, that allows you to um, uh, allows the machine to recognize the patient's heart rhythm and gate everything according to that because cardiac motion uh, uh, provides um, a great challenge if you can't hold the heart still. Um, uh, everything will look like a blur due to, um, uh, due to arrhythmias uh, and due to inability to gate, uh, gate to the um, heart rhythm. You need a contrast injection system uh, along with an IV pump that's, uh, because uh, in order to do the perfusion, you actually have to inject at a very, very fast rate. I'm talking like, like, a, um, like two cc's per, um, like, 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 a, 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 like almost a, a two cc's per minute kind of deal. Um, two liters per minute, I'm sorry. 
Uh, you also need to be able to communicate with the patient, and the, the intercom system is is also uh, um, uh, very important uh, because in order to do these image, uh, images, you actually have to have the ability to tell the patient to hold their breath. I mentioned cardiac motion before, diaphragmatic motion, breathing motion is also a big challenge, and so trying to have the patients hold their hold their uh, chest as still as possible um, and shallow breathe if, if they can't hold their breath is, is also helpful. And of course, if you're stressing a patient, um, anything can happen in terms of safety and adverse events, and that hence uh, having a, a monitor allowing you to monitor, monitor their oximetry, monitor their um, rhythm um, is also helpful. And of course, uh, having very well-qualified staff, um, be that uh, the, super, the reading attending of the day, um, having, having a, a having a, um, very helpful hel fellows, um, helping alongside to supervise, uh, supervise the stress, uh, having MRI techs that um, know their protocols well and know, know um, how to adapt things on the fly, as well as a nurse to help administer the medications and, and monitor the patient. So why CMR, um, and that's a hashtag that often trend, trends on Twitter, um, MR actually offers quite a few advantages. Um, there's no image quality degradation um, uh, compared to other modalities, so we, are, so we can actually uh, get a very wide field of view and see everything going on. Um, and uh, and uh, the worst, even on the worst CMR, um, a, a real-time image, you can actually see the endocardial borders, epicardial borders, and see the cardiac motion uh, uh, fairly well. There's no actual ionizing radiation, so there's no uh, risk of, um, of, uh, of causing a um, uh, causing a, a myelodysplasia or any kind of uh, cancer issues. Uh, we don't use a nephrotoxic agent. So while there is a concern um, that I'll bring up in the next point of, of a complication related, related to that, it is not nephrotoxic. It does not uh, um, cause the kidney, uh, kidney function to drop. Uh, we are assured that we can get the exact same reproducible image uh, in the same, in the same uh, uh, position in the patient uh, uh, because unless the patient moves around on the table, uh, everything is coded into our work, into our, our work system um, and encoded in the, in, in, in the acquired images as to the absolute patient's position uh, of where everything is. And, uh, and uh, 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 as I mentioned before, using gadolinium, we can actually look at uh, SCAR um, in addition, uh, indicating a prior infarct, um, in addition to looking at perfusion imaging as well. Not everyone can get an MRI, though, um, and it's not so much weight. Um, we can actually accommodate uh, very heavy patients, uh, um, at least uh, up to 450 pounds, uh, from what I'm aware. Uh, it's more of the bore size. So we're talking about like 60 centimeter bore for our our 1.5 Tesla magnets and 70 centimeter bores. So if a patient is too, too uh, 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 wide, um, uh, be it through the belly or through breasts or the shoulders, then, then that's an uh, uh, often unfortunate limitation with uh, uh, putting a patient in the magnet. Obviously a patient who has severe claustrophobia um, can't do it. I tried to have one of my own patients do it and he said he's simply uh, for a research study and he simply couldn't so we had to back off. Um, having a patient who can cooperate with breath holds, that's, this is more of a relative contraindication. We can still do studies uh, with the patient free breathing, but it's not as ideal because then we can't get uh, as, as pristine, uh, uh, clear, clear images uh, uh, using the real-time methods. And then I mentioned before, um, a very, very rare but uh, well-known complication with uh, gadolinium uh, seen, especially in, in renal patients uh, for nephrogenic systemic fibrosis. Nowadays, we use newer macrocyclic um, uh, ionic gadolinium agents, meaning these are caged in a nice, uh, nice ligand and very tightly bound, so that the free, so that the free gadolinium uh, cation, uh, me metal cation, which is toxic, won't won't uh, won't dissociate and cause problems. Uh, in fact, uh, we've recently moved to to with uh, with uh, uh, with a consulting nephrologist approval. Uh, inclu including a, uh, including a, a broader swath of patients uh, with renal issues, and, and with the judicious use of a, um, a different agent, a gadavist, uh, and not just doterm, but gadavist as well. So, uh, so uh, nowadays it, it never hurts to ask if a patient can get a CMR with gadolinium, because uh, we have expanded the population that that can, that can get it. So. I mentioned before, in terms of the two different uh, ways of uh, uh, doing stress testing, you can either do exercise testing or pharmacologic. I like to start off with the exercise testing with the MRI, and this is usually accomplished either through what's uh, with, uh, through um, a recumbent bike. Um, this is a load. Uh, this is a load load uh, bike. 
and um, as you can see, uh, um, the patient would 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 um, be recumbent and have their legs elevated, and then they would pedal pedal on the bike uh, to to achieve the uh, increase in their heart rate. And the nice thing is. Uh, um, uh, because the patient doesn't have to get out of the magnet, then you don't have to worry about losing, losing the position. However, this may not be the most comfortable for the patient who's already having to deal with a, uh, a, closed, uh, a small tube and other situations going on. Um, uh, believe it or not, there are some centers that have set up uh, um, uh, MRI-compatible treadmills, and, and this is a bit more involved. So what they actually have to do is they start off by imaging the patient at rest um, on, on the table, and they use a vacuum mattress that kind of creates a mold of the patient, uh, so kind of a memory of, of what the patient's uh, shape, is, shape is on and, and position on, on, on the, on the uh, MRI gurney. And, and uh, once they do their initial rest image protocol, then they get the patient hooked up and connected to the, in, to the, uh, um, to the uh, treadmill. Um, and then they have them run on the treadmill, do the bruise until they tire out. And then uh, almost immediately they, they are rushing, just like, just like a, a treadmill echo, rushing to get the patient back, on, back into the bed into the exact same position on, on that mold in the vacuum mattress. Um, st strapping the coils back onto the patient and pushing a button uh, on the uh, MRI scanner to do, begin automated uh, uh, follow-up scans to acquire synase and, and uh, what have you uh, with regards to uh, the, the hemodynamic assessments. Um, when it comes to um, how it compares with SPECT, uh, exercise uh, stress test is actually uh, uh, Actually, fairly uh, fairly reasonable, and in fact, uh, probably a, a bit better on the sensitivity side. Um, as you can see here, um, it was able to achieve a sensitivity of about 79% versus a, 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 a exercise spec. Um, but uh, of course, it depends on who, on what li literature you're looking, because I have seen higher sens sensitivities and specificity specificities reported for spec as well. But uh, specificity is a, um, actually a pretty good for the exercise stress CMR um, as well. Um, so I did mention the supine bike, and I also um, mentioned a, a, a treadmill and all that. Uh, there are other methods um, for for exercising and achieving a, a, peak, a peak heart rate, and these are sh these are shown here. Uh, you can do an ergometer, you can do a stepper, you can do isometric hand grip, you can do a prone exercise. Um, prone exercise is the most unnatural um, uh, and, uh, uh, of the form, uh, even though it's the cheapest, and it's usually reserved more for uh, spectroscopy experiments. Um, same with isometric hand grip, um, when you don't want the patient moving around too much. Uh, what is MR spectroscopy? Well, one thing that uh, was probably introduced by uh, Dr. Shaw and, uh, and in earlier talks is the fact that when we do MRI, we're imaging protons, uh, hydrogen atoms. Uh, so usually, um, usually mostly uh, water in the body, uh, although fat is also captured as well. Turns out uh, if you change the resonant frequency um, and, and you have the right sequences, and some vendors do have this, um, but it's more for research purposes, you can actually do, uh, you can actually dial in other atoms such as calcium, um, uh, phosphorus, um, carbon, um, and, and, uh, and, and, and get uh, imaging that way. Phosphorus is actually the most commonly used because of its association with ATP, and so you're able to actually get some metabolic activity information with that as well. But um, again, that's in the, in the, more in the research realm and, and uh, not exactly widely adopted for clinical use. That being said, exercise CMR has continued to evolve. A recent uh, review article um, uh, um, by, a, by a group in the UK and JCMR uh, gave a nice overview showing that uh, it, um, it has been explored in small populations, exercise CMR, um, spanning from congenital heart disease with uh, tetralogy of flow to looking at athletic heart disease to looking at CTEF versus uh, cardiac arrest patients. Um, uh, looking at the RV, um, looking at the RV uh, uh, function and changes, uh, looking at uh, changes in aortic regurgitation um, uh, dynamics uh, with exercise. It's even been used in diabetic heart disease, and even and the most intriguing thing that uh, uh, that has been uh, also been e examined is also looking at ischemic heart disease um, uh, without the use of contrast. Uh, the idea being that with T, you, you can actually get a T1 um, weighted imaging of the heart uh, before and after stress. And that uh, I, um, ideally, you'd be able to detect a shift in, in T1 due to the increased uh, capillary flow, um, uh, myocardial blood flow through the, through the myocardium as well. Um, it, the, uh, a group has already shown that in, in patients who have, who have uh, heart disease, um, that they have less of a shift in T1 um, uh, versus, the, uh, versus healthy controls. 
problems. But um, a lot of things coming um, down the pipeline from the exercise CMR side. Well, this is all nice and dandy, but why not just uh, image the, um, the coronaries themselves and, and, and take, a, take a good look at, at those? And yes, it is possible. Um, we do have, a, uh, do have 3D imaging techniques um, um, uh, where we can acquire 3D images of the heart with a good spatial resolution and, and, uh, and see the coronaries. Um, in fact, uh, my fellows will note all the time that uh, if I can see the coronaries well, I'll comment on their origins uh, um, if, if it's captured well in, in different views. And, uh, but, and, and in terms of the sensitivity and specificity, it's actually not terrible. Um, you, you, can sh you can see here with this meta-analysis that, uh, uh, with this pool analysis, I should say, um, that the uh, sensitivity and specificity um, is actually uh, fa fairly decent for, for picking up coronary stenosis on coronary MRI. That being said, um, uh, we acknowledge our spatial resolution is, is, uh, is not as, uh, doesn't compete as well with, uh, with, uh, card with uh, cardiac CT. And so if one has a question about, uh, uh, about the uh, coronaries, uh, cardiac CT is probably the better way to go, given, given its speed, uh, uh, speed and spatial resolution. Okay. Um, but MRI has also been used uh, in the pediatric population uh, to look for uh, anomalous coronaries, and uh, um, there, there's a, a pretty good, and there's pretty good accuracy with that. And as you can see here, in, in this uh, um, a collection of uh, case series, um, there's over 90% uh, detection of anomalous coronaries. So it, it is reasonable to send a patient um, if if they're not willing to undergo a CAT scan um, uh, for for uh, for coronary MRI. Okay. Now, uh, I, I, meant, uh, now uh, I, I mentioned uh, the use of exercise. I'm going to shift gears and move more t towards pharmacologic m means for doing CMR. And um, this is, should look a bit familiar. Uh, usually what we start off is with a, um, a standard CINE to get the idea of uh, cardiac volumes and function. And then we, and then we begin the uh, stress with uh, infusing dobutamine. And uh, um, just just as you, as you would with echo, uh, with dobutamine stress echo as well. Afterwards, then we uh, introduce the gadolinium contrast and um, uh, during recovery, and then do the uh, scar imaging to follow through. Okay. So um, this is a case that I think uh, those of you who've who've uh, who've uh, seen this talk before are familiar with. This is a 60-year-old man. He had effort-induced chest pain at four weeks, and past medical history is only notable for de uh, degenerative joint disease. So let me switch over. And uh, shown here are, um, uh, are uh, the different stages of the dobutamine stress um, uh, um, on each row. And you can see um, at resting, there's pretty good squeeze, uh, a pretty good wall motion on, on the three short axis from base, from base to apex. Uh, here's the two, uh, four, and three. Everything uh, afterwards is stacked uh, in corresponding fashion. And shown here is uh, um, uh, images acquired at 10, at 10 mics per kilo per minute, then at 20, and then at 40. And uh, 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 I don't know if any of the people on Zoom uh, wish to chime in, but uh, um, does anyone see a wall motion abnormality? See, see any kind of uh, um, abnormal, abnormal wall motion? And if so, where do, they, where do they think it is? Feel free to unmute yourselves. Okay. Lateral wall. That is correct, Carlos. Um, the, the lateral wall is kind of hang, hanging a little bit. You see it's not thickening as well. And if I put my, put my mouse here, It doesn't come in as vigorously towards the center of the cavity. Uh, th this portion here, compared to the, compared to the other walls, and you and you see the same same wall motion here. Okay. So it turns out when you look at the scar imaging, this this patient had an infarct in this region, and as can be seen with the the um, the the th uh, s mild thinning of the wall and also uh, bright subendocardial. Um, uh, Lake adalinium enhancement, suggestive of a prior infarct. So very good. So dobutamine CMR has been around for a while. It's evolved over the years since the uh, since the 90s through now, 
and, uh, and, and is still, still an option. In fact, uh, I was aware, uh, at least un until a few years ago, that next door in St. Luke's, uh, Dr. Chung uh, still used dobutamine for, for stress. It does represent some challenges, though, because when the heart rate goes very fast, that makes acquisition um, uh, very, very challenging. And then, uh, and then compound that with the fact that the patient is feeling uh, is not usually feeling well, and not feeling comfortable, stuck in a magnet uh, with all this stuff going on. Um, and uh, other use we ha um, that has been used for it uh, uh, before that we still have some cases in our own in our own repository is of uh, looking uh, assessing the aortic valve. Um, uh, um, so pretty much the equivalent of dobutamine stress echo for. Uh, for for uh, um, for ruling out pseudostenosis and aortic stenosis as well. Um, WCMR is actually fairly accurate. Um, panels A and B. Uh, so this is a meta analysis of of uh, of, uh, of uh, over uh, uh, over uh, fif uh, about 15 studies or so. Panels A and B show vasodilator stress. You can see the pool analysis shows a sensitivity uh, roughly about 0 0.9, and the specific specificity is about 0 0.8. Compare that with dobutamine, and dobutamine is actually is actually um, um, uh, fairly up there for dobutamine CMR as well. So it, it still exists, but it still represents some challenges and not the most ideal. This led to the question of uh, uh, what about using vasodilator stress, and then also what about uh, what about doing perfusion uh, per, per, perfusion imaging. Um, so the idea with perfusion imaging is you would inject a patient uh, rapidly with a uh, with a bolus of contrast. It would highlight the different uh, uh, chambers before settling out uh, settling out through the coronaries, and and, uh, and perfusing the myocardium. So so these are shown diff in different stages um, uh, from left to right here. And, uh, and uh, the green and red curves here represent uh, uh, signal intensity uh, in the respective uh, uh, tissue or blood cap or cavity. The red represents the blood LV blood cavity, and as you can see, there's a big spike. And then the myocardium later on begins, be begins uh, lighting up with contrast as the um, coronaries and capillaries fill. Okay. This is just a, um, uh, this is just a, um, uh, this Hopefully this will play for me. Let's see. This is supposed to be a video that demonstrates uh, perfu the, the perfusion principles, but it shows the same thing, that the, the RV cavity would light, light first, which makes sense with the um, contrast coming through the venous system first. Um, then passing through the um, pulmonary circulation, returning through the LA and then the LV, then beginning to light up the myo myocardium here. But we'll have further examples uh, where we, we'll get to see the perfusion, uh, pr uh, perfusion in, in practice and see some, some, some abnormalities here. Um, back when I was uh, um, in college um, and, and medical school in Northwestern, I had no idea next door going on that uh, Dr. Francis Clocky and, and, uh, uh, and uh, Dr. Uh, Kim and Judd and even Dr. Shaw were, were around and, and doing some early work with uh, with, with uh, uh, different things they could do with uh, with uh, with, uh, with, with cardi cardiac MRI imaging, and uh, they were able to demonstrate that uh, they were able to see see uh, regional differences of two folds um, in, in in perfusion abnormality differences. So yes. The answer is yes. They can see perfusion differences. They even used mic um, microsphere bubbles as a as a gold standard and compared it with a with with a, with a thallium spect and and they and they found that um, the ability uh, the ability to look for perfusion abnormalities was compar was comparable. Okay. So the bottom line in answer to my earlier question is yes, perfusion is, is feasible and possible and is very commonly done uh, on the MRI side. Okay. So how does MRI compare with SPECT, though? Um, here's a table showing what's assessed by the different modalities and, uh, and uh, what's, what the spatial resolution is, as well as the temporal resolution. Um, with, um, with CMR, we do have superior spatial resolution when it, com when it comes to uh, SPECT. And uh, in terms of uh, uh, um, imaging, we can acquire uh, acquire very quickly, um, less than 150 milliseconds, uh, um, every every ultra, every heartbeat or every other heartbeat. If we need to, if we need to get more more slice uh, more slices in, um, spect um, usually looks at uh, eight eight, uh, eight frames in general, and, and can't resolve uh, re resolved uh, temporal resolution on that front. 
With the advent uh, of PET here, we now have the uh, opportunity to look at um, much more improved spatial resolution at two to three, three millimeters. And so with Dr. Amala spearheading that, uh, help, uh, you'll hear more about that um, in, in, the in the next talks um, in the future. Uh, things have evolved since then. Um, the Europeans have gone ahead and done further validation studies uh, of CMR compared with, uh, compared with uh, um, um, SPECT and, and also against uh, invasive coronary angi angiography. And this is how, uh, this is how CMR and SPECT uh, uh, compare on the MR impact uh, study, uh, where they recruited patients and all of them got uh, coronary angiographies in addition to CMR and SPECT. And CMR um, actually, uh, actually had good sensitivity and specificity um, as well um, on, on the pool, pool analysis, and then looking at the reader level as well. And these were statistically different uh, versus SPECT. Okay. This has gone farther and uh, um, entered a, into a much larger cohort. Uh, there's a EURCMR registry where uh, over 27,000 um, uh, cases were, were put into the database, and, and, they found, and they found that with CMR they were able to actually avoid um, uh, avoid the cath lab in, in a lot of cases. So, so in other words, uh, CMR, the use of stress CMR was able to change management in these patients as well. So, so, um, uh, so, so th there is proof that, that uh, it, it can alter management and, and, and save, a, save a patient a, a diagno uh, unnecessary diagnostic procedure. Okay. Shown here is the protocol for, uh, for vaso vasodilator stress. Uh, we start off with typically with a CINE. Uh, uh, getting again the volume and the volume and function uh, um, uh, of the uh, of the ventricles and the uh, atria. We also uh, do an optional uh, look at morphology, so just a standard scan from top to bottom uh, 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 of the chest. We follow through with a uh, stress perfusion, um, and and. Uh, and then uh, do some additional imaging in between, usually either phase contrast, although we have moved more to doing phase contrast before the stress because of the change in hemodynamics induced by stress. Then we follow up with a rest imaging, uh, a rest imaging uh, for the rest comparison. And then after um, uh, 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 enough of a delay, at least 10, 15 minutes, then we follow up with a delayed enhancement to look, at, uh, to look, uh, look for a presence of scar. So when you do all this, you have a ton of data. You can get wall motion up from the cine, you can get um, uh, stress abnormalities, you can get rest abnormalities, and you can get um, uh, um, uh, ab uh, abnormal enhancement um, scar. That, pro that provides a lot of different combinations, um, uh, depending, depending, because uh, uh, either all of them can be normal, all of them can be ab abnormal, and everything in between. So this represents a challenge. How would you go about systematically approaching this to answer the question answer a simple question of whether or not the patient has coronary artery disease. And that's what Dr. Clem and, and company did, uh, did um, um, uh, at Duke. And uh, they came up with this algorithm where they start off looking at, at the CMR and, and they start off by actually, uh, they start at the very end. They look at, uh, look at, uh, uh, look at the, for the presence of scar. If there's presence of uh, scar in, the, in, a, uh, in a vascular distribution, that's suggestive of a CID. If it was absent, then you go back and look at the stress. And if you st see a stress abnormality, uh, if, you, if you see no stress abnormality, you're done. You're, it's, uh, there, there's no, CA, uh, no sig hemodynamically significant CAD present. If it comes back positive, uh, then you have to look at the rest perfusion. And uh, here's where uh, uh, one has to understand a very key difference versus what, what's reported by, by SPECT, by, by the uh, nuclear folks. If you see a reversible defect, in other words, it's present on stress but disappears on rest, then yes, that, uh, that suggests CAD. That suggests that there's likely a hemodynamically significant lesion that appears only with, uh, vas with, uh, with increased uh, um, coronary blood flow. If you, do, if you see a defect that's present on rest that's also present on stress, that usually, you, that usually means that uh, this is likely an artifact and not real. It's not CAD. Because the uh, concept in the uh, nuclear world is that if you have a quote match defect, that indicates infarct. But if you, but uh, in the MRI world, uh, we've already ruled out whether or not there's an infarct. That was already done with the delayed enhancements. Um, if a patient has an um, uh, infarct scar, you're you're done. There's infarct. Um, there, whereas if it's matched, uh, like I said, that's that's uh, that's not suggestive of, of MI. That's not suggestive of an infarct. 
So, so that's a one key message I want to uh, hammer home about stress EMR interpretation. Um, a match defect does not mean infarct. It does not mean, mean coronary disease. In fact, it usually means quite the opposite. Um, so uh, please keep that in mind. Um, with that, I'd like to, I, I like to uh, go through a case with you to show, show this algorithm in practice. And uh, um, I want to begin with, with uh, this first case here. So let me switch over to that case. And I believe that's uh, I, I believe that's this this case here. And um, as you can see, uh, we have uh, the cines on top. We have stress on the next row, and we have rest uh, on the following row, and then we have the corresponding delayed enhancement um, uh, um, uh, presented here. Here, with delayed enhancements, um, the technique is used to null myocardium. In other words, normal, healthy myocardium appears black. So going through the algorithm, uh, we look through. We see that the, um, L, um, that the myocardium all looks black. You can even see the RV myocardium uh, fairly decently here. And it all indicates that everything is, is normal, healthy myocardial tissue that's, con that's contracting. No, no real scar. Okay. That takes us to our next step. Let's look at our stress. So let's, looking at our stress, and I'll let this play a few times, but the, the take home point about, about these uh, stress images is everything is not lighting up uniformly. You're seeing the RV enhance, you're seeing the LV enhance, and then the myocardium enhancing um, um, uh, lighter gray. Um, but uh, there's no, no uh, uh, blackness, there's no uh, delay, delay in, the, in the perfusion of, of the myocardium. So this indicates that this patient has no CAD. This was confirmed on angio. And as you can see here, this patient just has luminal irregularities, but no real, no real uh, stenotic lesions to write home about. Maybe something in the diagonal, but, but uh, uh, near the ostium of the diagonal, but uh, again, nothing to write home about. Okay. Contrast this with uh, this case. And uh, let me pull this up. Give me one second. And the first thing you'll notice uh, for those who, who are who uh, are who already caught on. Um, this patient has sternotomy wires. These, these are metallic artifacts from sternotomy wires. So this patient's had higher bypass. So, so things are already not right to begin with. Um, so if you, if you ask me the question whether or not this patient had coronary disease, well, just the fact that there's sternal wires, I'm already clued in that there's a very high chance um, that that's going to be the case. Um, It looks like these images disappeared. OK. For some reason, it's not pulling up these images. But uh, these images will show scar in, in uh, all sorts of different um, uh, subendocardial scar in all sorts of different territories, um, uh, which brings back a, a point about patients with cabbage. Everything you know about uh, native, uh, native vascular territories and, and distributions kind of go out the window when, when, a patient, when a patient has had cabbage because of um, uh, the change in, in plumbing and, and, and change in available um, uh, circulation as well. But looking at the stress, you can clearly see on the stress that uh, there are definite areas, especially more prominent in the mid and apex uh, of uh, subendocardial defects. And that these actually these actually go away with rest. 
So bottom line is this patient had a mixed picture of a mixed ischemia and infarct. Um, infarct because of his prior, uh, prior uh, cardiac history, prior bypasses, and then has uh, more extensive uh, ischemia. So, so this moves beyond simply just asking whether or not there's CAD present. This also begins asking whether or not there's, there's infarct uh, and ischemia and whether or not the two correlate with each other. You may wonder what happens if, uh, the, if you do see a defect and it's in the same, region, the same exact region as where you see scar and they're perfectly matched. Then that's usually likely indicative of, of, uh, uh, of uh, um, infarct and no more. Um, we don't try to read too much into this and, and claim there's peri-infarct ischemia or anything, uh, unless it's very obviously in a, in a, a, a greater uh, myocardial um, distribution than, than, than expected for the scar. But, this, but uh, this patient was found uh, to have occluded LED uh, with collaterals. He was also have found to have a o OM2 um, 50, 60% bifurcation as well. And last, uh, it, last I want to show you is, is uh, di this different case, um, uh, this different case uh, that represents the concept of resting ischemia. So remember I talked about patients um, getting, getting, a, getting the uh, stress portion then waiting a bit, and then, and then getting the rest portion. And you'll, no, you'll notice there's actually a little bit of subendocardial ischemia right in the inferior lateral, inferior and septal walls here. And if you look on the, if you look on the rest images, There's a, it's not as obvious on, uh, on the screen, but uh, uh, there, there is some persistence of that, uh, that ischemia. So that's important uh, um, that you make sure that when you stress a patient and then wait to do the rest phase, you give the patient ample opportunity to return to a rest state. Otherwise, you may end up with these, quote, match defect, which are, are not real. Um, that, that just simply re represent that uh, uh, one either waited, waited, waited uh, too short before uh, pursuing the rest protocol, or the patient may has, have uh, so significant ischemia that, it, that uh, they never quite fully recover after you stress them uh, on the perfusion imaging. Okay. And then, uh, and then uh, going on with another case, um, this is a 54-year-old year, um, man. He's been having uh, six months of a dyspnea on exertion, no classical agent uh, on, uh, on, uh, on interview. Hendra went to treadmill test. He achieved three minutes, and then uh, had had the study terminated for for uh, dyspnea fatigue, and underwent pharmacological stress CMR. So let me pull that up again. So for anyone in the audience, um, especially the fellows, what do you guys see? You guys are experts now. George, I see you're on. Uh, do you want to mute yourself? Yeah. Uh, yeah what, what? Uh, I'm not seeing the full screen now, but the interior uh, had something in the inferior, had something like this from the first glance I had. Yes, so there's something in the uh, anterior wall. You can see uh, Yes, Dr. Here. Yang, I can, looking at the images here, let's see, I'm gonna blow up the size so I can see it a little better. Oh, George, you too. Okay, <laughs> we have both Georges. <laughs> But uh, I'll, I'll, I'll let, uh, thank you, George Waits. Uh, Sorry, George, there was a delay. I'm... George, uh, George uh, Debu already, already chimed in, and, and uh, he, he already indicated there's something in the anterior wall. There's also something in the septum as well, and you can see it more, even more prominently in the apex. There's even more involvement here. And this actually reverses, completely reverses. I, I, hope this, I hope you can see this well. I hope, it, I hope it's uh, projecting well for you guys. But when we look, and look at the delayed enhancement, there's nothing there. So it turns out this patient um, uh, had coronary artery disease, so he underwent cath. And he was actually found to have multivessel disease. He had 90% proximal LED, 95% proximal RCA, and 70% OM1. And so he, so he got sent for multivessel cabbage um, based on, uh, after getting cath for his uh, 
uh, stress, stress test results. And then, um, and then there's a second case, 61-year-old uh, man with CAT CAD stress test for, for vessel cabbage. Uh, let me see if this is the right, the right study as well. No, I think that was the study here, yeah. But uh, again, this, um, this, that, that, uh, that study was, was meant to highlight a, a case of mixed uh, LGE and mix, mixed uh, CAD as well. Things have evolved since then. Um, the Europeans, again, uh, uh, did, did uh, not one but two CMARC studies where they were uh, validating against coronary, coronary um, uh, against SPECT and coronary angiography. Again, showed very good sensitivity and specificity. You guys get the point. Uh, showed good, um, uh, good ROC curves, um, good AUC for, predi for predicting a significant CAD um, by, by, uh, by um, vessels, by significant stenosis, for, for, uh, by patients, and also by, uh, by looking at uh, different, different uh, individual vessels. They also did CMARC2, um, and this was kind of to see uh, if this would, if this would uh, um, alter management in terms of angiography. And the answer was yes, it did. Um, they, they found there was actually a 21% um, absolute reduction in, in unnecessary invasive angiography um, versus conventional NICE guidelines. Um, that's the UK guidelines for, for, for evaluating, um, evaluating uh, coronary disease and chest pain. What about prog prognosis? Uh, if you have a positive stress test, does that uh, imply anything, any, anything good or bad? And, and uh, yes, uh, if you have a positive stress test, uh, your annualized event rate for cardiovascular events goes up. Um, so in this case, you can see um, uh, cardi cardiovascular death is, is definitely increased uh, substantially um, by, by over three times that uh, of a negative stress CMR. Um, same thing for not fatal AMI. And when combined, you almost get a, a five times um, a five times increase in risk. This has evolved even further. Um, our institution has participated, uh, uh, along with Duke and and uh, New York Presbyterian and Piedmont uh, and uh, uh, other organizations, and looked at uh, the prognostic value of vasodilator stress in in larger cohorts. So, in about uh, almost in, in about 9,000 patients or so. so um, that, that got scanned and, and uh, found to have either normal or abnormal uh, um, stress tests. Uh, yes, indeed, it, it was predictive of, 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 uh, of uh, a, a future event-free survival. As you can see, those who had abnormal, abnormal studies um, uh, did worse from a survival perspective. The same group also went back and looked at about 1,700 patients and, and tried to see if, if a stress CMR could reclassify these patients um, in, in, in terms of the, their disease severity. And again, yes, they, they found, they found uh, that was indeed the case. They had uh, NRI, NRIs uh, easily in the high 20s to 30s, um, uh, meaning that's the number, percentage of patients that get reclassified. And, and these are graphs showing, showing a, um, uh, patients who were initially um, using using a, using a model uh, a model predicting uh, risk of uh, risk of uh, uh, events um, uh, risk of events if they start off low intermediate or high risk how did how did they get restratified by by stress CMR and then the subsequent uh, observed events um, in, in in these uh, in these populations as well in, in these subgroups okay. But the answer is yes, it, can, it does reclassify. Um, the MR informed study, uh, I believe that is, uh, uh, I believe that's concluded, and um, th this this is a, a direct head-to-head -head comparison of MRI versus FFR, um, and and they found there, there was actually at, um, no no statistically significant difference be between the two, but uh, one has to look carefully because. Uh, unless a study is designed for non-inferiority versus versus uh, superiority, um, they may not uh, may not always necessarily be powered to to look for difference. Um, 
I always point out that if you want to design a non-inferior inferior, uh, study, you're trying to establish that, uh, that uh, the, the difference equals zero. That's what you're actually testing, uh, testing and hoping for, as opposed to um, A, is great, A is greater than B uh, kind of deal for superiority study. Uh, this is an oldie but goodie from last year. Um, everyone still talks about the ischemia trial, and CMR was used as one of the criteria for, for looking for ischemia. Um, and uh, they, they were pretty strict. You can see uh, they were looking for greater than 12% of the myocardium or greater than uh, uh, three out of, uh, out of the 16, 17 segment model uh, being abnormal as well. So yes, CMR did have a role to play in the ischemia trial as well. And I won't belabor the point about the ischemia trial. Um, um, uh, but because I think that's been beaten, beaten to death. Okay. Stress CMR is uh, appropriate in certain circumstances. Uh, please be aware of your appropriate use uh, criteria. Uh, criteria. Uh, these, these are appropriate use criteria uh, put out by the ACC and AHA. The, this, the last iteration was in 2014. And as you can see, uh, stress CMR is appropriate in those, like I said, who are intermediate pretest uh, and uh, unable, to, um, unable to exercise or if they're able to exercise but have high pretest, CM, stress CMR is still reasonable if you want to get to greater sensitivity uh, for detecting CAD. Uh, same thing for uninterpretable. And uh, uh, stress CMR is actually a pr considered appropriate for evaluation for, for ischemic equivalent. So if a patient doesn't have a standard ischemic symptom of chest pain but has something squirrely, then, then that can also be pursued. Last but not least, uh, we still work very closely with Dr. Naga and with, uh, with uh, uh, with his uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy population. And uh, um, uh, this, this area is an em uh, emerging, er emerging area as well. We still do protocols where we uh, look at patients with HOCAM and uh, uh, look for global subendocardial ischemia consistent with HCM. We can also look at the morphology as well. Uh, down the road, there's been talks of using higher strength magnet magnets to look at the uh, uh, myofibril arrangement because unlike a normal heart where everything is organized into, into sheets, um, into very uh, organized isotropic sh sheets, um, uh, in HOCAM, there's, there's fibrillar disarray. There's complete disarray of, uh, of these sheets. And uh, this can actually be, be picked up, uh, picked up uh, um, using certain CMR techniques as well. Okay. In the interest of time, I'm not going to go over the HCM case. I'll just summarize that pharmacological stress CMR um, is very much a well-established uh, method uh, for detecting CAD and risk pro prognostication. It uh, does have a role in detection, detecting microvascular schema in HCM. And um, as I mentioned before, exercise stress CMR is uh, moving, uh, moving very well along and, uh, uh, and maybe emerging as another um, area of, of interest uh, for down the road um, for, for assessing for functional capacity, et cetera, um, uh, uh, and assessing other um, effects, exercise effects on, on different uh, cardiac chambers as well. Thank you for your attention, and, I, and I'm happy to take any questions at this time. Why were you saying CMR is or inferring or trying to infer that CMR could be superior to FFR? I was certainly not. Uh, I was certainly not implying that. Um, what I was stating was the fact that the trial, that the uh, MR impact um, uh, study, may not have been powered enough, and that's why they didn't see a difference between CMR and FFR. Any other questions? OK, looks like we started at the top of the hour. Um, and I thank everyone for their attention. Um, thank you for joining us today. And we'll see you next time. <laughs>